look at part one. Part one. You'll hear a conversation between two students in the dining hall of the college. First, you have some time to read questions one to four. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. Hi, Max. How are you? Hi, Melanie. I'm fine. In fact, I'm preparing the coming holidays, and I want to have a car tour with my friends. That sounds lovely. How is your preparation? Well, I haven't begun yet because I'm not quite sure how to rent a car and what the expense is like, and something like this. Ha! <laughs> You've run into the right person. I did the same last holiday, and I can recommend it to you. I went to Avis Rent a Car Company, which is at fourteen A Dover Road, Oxford. Let me write it down. Is it D O V E R? Yes, and the telephone number is six three four zero nine six three. But if you book for the first time, dial another number with extension. That is six three four zero eight five three. Extension fifty four. Okay, thank you very much. I'll have a try. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions five to ten. Now listen to the conversation between Max and the assistant, and answer questions five to ten. Good morning, Avis Rent a Car Company. How can I help you? Hi, I want to book a car for tour. I want to inquire some information about the grade of the cars and the prices. No problem. We offer a wide selection of rental cars to choose from, from luxury car to economy car, compact car, minivan, and pickup truck. Well,、uh, luxury car is obviously out of my price range, but compact or economy is not big enough. You know, we have seven persons together. Well, how about a minivan? It's perfect for road trips and will make your journey feel like you're in a living room on wheels. I think that's good. Well, what does it feature? I, I mean, what facilities does it have? Unlike most minivans with manual transmission, the rental minivan cars have feature automatic transmission, air conditioning, and AM/FM stereo. If you drive a long, smooth way, you can use the cruise control, which will save you a lot of energy. Good. How much is the price? If you rent an intermediate one, it will cost you fifty-five pounds each day. If it is standard, the cost is forty-five pounds per day. I think the standard is enough. Oh, we have a special fifty percent discount for weekends from Friday to Sunday, but that doesn't apply to tax, recovery fees, and optional services. Well, what are the optional services? Well, they usually include some extra facilities like first aid kit or something like that.、Uh, I know. We plan to start off on Friday, so we have to prepare one day in advance. I want to book from thirtieth of April, which is Thursday. And it will end next Monday. Okay. Could you leave your name and the driving license number? My name is Max, and the license number is M nine zero two one. Okay. You can pick up the car on Thursday noon. Besides, we offer some optional services like street maps, flashlight, and sunsheet. What would you like to have?、Mm, flashlight is not necessary, I think. But street maps are useful, especially when we drive in a strange place. As for the sun sheet, I'd like to give that a miss. We don't want to spend too much extra money. Okay, Mr. Max. Thank you for calling. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear someone talking about traveling around New Zealand. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to fifteen. When thinking about beautiful countryside or stunning views, it has long been accepted that Australia and New Zealand have few equals. What is perhaps slightly less well known is what these countries can offer to the avid train enthusiast. Both countries have railways which pass through breathtaking scenery in the utmost of comfort. In New Zealand, you can travel from the country's biggest city, Auckland, to where a third of the population lives, its capital, Wellington, on the longest passenger rail service in the country, the Overlander. Crossing 681 kilometres, the train winds through the lush farmland of the Waikato and up the Rarumu Spiral onto an amazing volcanic plateau surrounded by native bush. On a clear day, you will be able to see three of New Zealand's most famous volcanoes, Mount Ruapehu, Mount Narahoe, and Mount Tongariro. The whole journey can be completed in 11 hours, but for those keen to see a little more of the country, the trip can be extended over three or four days. This gives travellers the opportunity of seeing the famous Waitomo Caves, relaxing in the mud pools of Rotorua, or skydiving over Lake Taupo. Moving on to the South Island, you can take the Transalpine through the Southern Alps, travelling from the South Pacific Ocean to the Tasman Sea. Climbing from Christchurch right into the Alps, this 223km trip is particularly impressive as the train passes through 16 tunnels before descending to Greymouth at the end of the line. Taking only 5 hours, this is a relatively short trip, but it is worth noting that this journey has been listed as the sixth most scenic rail route in the world. For those that are not so keen on mountains, the South Island has a second option, the Transcoastal. With the sea on one side and the mountains on the other, it again shows some of the best scenery New Zealand has to offer. Also taking five hours, one of the highlights of this journey is the opportunities for whale watching. The fortunate few that see whales are well rewarded, but there are more common sights which are just as enjoyable, such as penguins and seals. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Although these three train journeys are undeniably breathtaking, some travellers prefer the longer journeys on offer in Australia. The Indian Pacific, for example, which travels from Sydney through to Perth and has been dubbed the adventure that spans Australia. With three nights on board, the train takes in the Blue Mountains and the Nullarbor Plains and, as the name implies, the Indian Pacific shows you two oceans. This train journey holds two world records. Covering 4,352 kilometres, it is one of the world's longest train journeys. It also travels the world's longest straight stretch of railway track, 478 kilometres. For those who find these distances a little daunting, passengers can stretch their legs at a number of different stops, such as Kalgoorlie, famous for gold, and Broken Hill, first founded as a silver mine. 
If three days on board a train seems a little excessive, there are alternatives. The Garn, for example, which travels from Adelaide in the south to Alice Springs in the centre of the continent, taking 20 hours. Passing through Crystal Brook, Port Augusta and Woomera, this journey gives an indication of what life was like for the earlier settlers as they discovered the country. Along the way, you can also see the Iron Man sculpture, which was constructed by railway workers to commemorate the one millionth concrete sleeper laid during the construction of the line. Finally, just a quick word about the Overland, which runs between Melbourne and Adelaide. As the first train to travel between the capitals of two states, it is a historic as well as relaxing way to travel, and is famous for being the oldest long-distance train journey on the continent. With so many memorable journeys to choose from, the only problem you will have is knowing which one to do first. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. We'll hear a discussion between three students, David, Joseph, and Carrie. In the first part of the discussion, they will be talking about lounges in different school buildings on campus. First look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Hey, Joseph. Long time no see. How's it going? Oh, hey, David. It's going fine. I'm a little overwhelmed with all these new courses, but I'm hanging in there. Have you met my girlfriend, Carrie? No. Hi, Carrie. Hi, David. Joseph told me about you. You two had quite the time last semester in European history, I hear. Yeah, we like to hang out after class. Now it's a little harder, though. Lounges aren't as good as they were back there in Wilson Hall. Yeah, they had chairs, couches and tables to put your stuff on. And that lounge was full. There must have been 25 seats in there. Really? The lounge in Jones Hall, where I have my communications course, only has about ten chairs. It's awful. We all just stand around or leave. I wish we could hang out more. Well, Agriculture Hall is next door. Their lounge is on the first floor, and it has couches. I think there are about six of them. And they're comfortable, and hardly used at all. That's not a good idea. Thanks. But don't go to lounge at Skidmore Hall. I don't even know why they call it a lounge. It's just four chairs in the corner of the main walkway. In the second part of the discussion, David, Joseph and Carrie continue talking about conducting a survey. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Guys, we should really do something about those lounges. I mean, couldn't we gather signatures and try to get the university to improve some of the facilities? 
Yeah, that's a great idea. But we can't just say something random like, oh, you need to make the buildings nicer. We should come up with some kind of ranking system and have students rank buildings, how beautiful they are, how nice they are, etc. Well, if we were ranking on a scale of one to three, you all know that I would rank Skidmore Hall a one. Like I just said, that place is awful. No facilities. The bathrooms are way down in the basement. You're right. But they do have a nice balcony on the third floor. That might increase its value. But you shouldn't rank the architecture. You should rank how nice the building is for students to hang out in. Oh, OK. Then I agree with you. So should we do this? I think it's a great idea. But let's try it ourselves on a couple buildings so that we can work out any bugs in it. I think Wilson Hall is the best. Sure, but we've already begun. We will give a building one point if it has poor facilities, not enough chairs and no vending machines, that kind of thing. And give a building two points if it is OK or acceptable. We can rank buildings that we really like as having three points. So like Joseph said, I think Wilson Hall is the best. It should have three points for sure. And Skidmore has a one. Now what other buildings should we rank? How about Merris Hall? No, they're not done with that one yet. But it looks like that will be a good place to hang out. How about Agriculture Hall? You said something about that hall a bit earlier. Oh yeah. They have that lounge with couches that no one uses. But that might indicate that people don't hang out there for other reasons. They don't have any drink machines. That's why I never go there. Oh, well, then I think it's an average building. Let's give it the middle ranking. I agree. It could be improved slightly, but it's got a couple of nice features. I like that lounge in that third floor, for example, but the stairs are too short. I always trip when I'm walking up them. This ranking is getting complex. OK, one building we haven't talked about is Canton Hall. What do you guys think of Canton? Is that next to the law building? Yep. It's got this excellent connecting corridor with chairs and desks to relax and work at. The cafeteria there is great too. I think that place is just as good as Wilson. Well, I've only been there once and didn't know that was what it was called. It was kind of confusing, and it's kind of far for me to go, but I liked it, so I'll give it the middle ranking. Two points because it had nice facilities, but a poor and confusing layout. Oh, Joseph, you like Canton Hall? I hate that place. It's so mechanical, cold and impersonal. The furniture is nice, sure, but it's the last place on campus I would go to. I give it a one. Interesting. Well, let's write this little survey up and start passing it around. I don't have time to type it up. Can you? Sure. I'll do it after my biology class. Should we meet up at Wilson tonight around 8? Sure. No problem. We'll see you then. That is the end of part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a tutor giving some business students instructions about a finance project. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
OK, can you quieten down, please? Now, today I'm going to talk to you about your assignment. We've been studying the effects of the exchange rate, so I'm going to give you a project to do on this. Right, can you make some notes while I'm talking? The first thing that I'd like you to do in order to prepare this is to select where you're interested in. I mean, which country, and therefore which currency you're going to be operating in. OK, now the purpose of the project is to make money, and I'm hoping some of you will make a significant amount. So, I want you to suppose that you have £100 that you will have to invest purely in the rises and falls of the exchange system. In other words, you'll be trying to predict rates. This is a project that you'll be doing together, but before you work together, you'll have to go off and research what you need to know about the economy of that country and how well it's doing or is expected to do in the near future. You could all make up a little information sheet with your notes on, clearly legible, because then I want you to get together, we can do that next week, and to go round and read about each other's countries. When you see how well or badly each country is doing, I want you to decide what your exchange rate is going to be against all the other currencies. After that is all sorted, what you're going to do is go round the other students and attempt to sell your money to the others. Remember, this will depend on the success of your country's economy and the rate you fixed for your currency. Now, you're not allowed to just swap currencies with each other, but you may wish to buy from the other countries. But you must do a proper transaction. All the way through this, you must keep your accounts properly for each transaction. I'll give you one week to do this, and then we will set a time for the deals to finish, a bit like the stock exchange. And at that point, I will ask you to calculate how much you have made. Is that clear? You now have 30 seconds to read questions 37 to 40. OK, now before you begin that, there are a few things I want you to read up on to prepare. You need to look at the economies of the UK's main trading partners. I don't mean all of them, because that would be over 80, but just the 29 principal ones. There are summaries in the last three books on the book list I've given you. And so that you can practice applying the criteria on assessment I gave you, I'd then like you to focus just on one sector across all the countries. The most common one across every country is farming. But as much agricultural produce is for domestic consumption, I'd like you to look at manufacturing. Then I would like you to do a detailed investigation of one particular aspect. I was going to give you a choice, but I think as we've just started the course, it's better if we all look at the same thing and then we can discuss it in the seminars. So the thing I'd like you all to look at is fluctuations in import prices. Now, you need to do all that before you start the project as it will help you assess the economies of the countries you'll be representing in the project. Don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Exam week is December the 8th. 
Then it's the holidays until January the 6th. So I don't need the project in till February the 5th. Is that okay? Now, any questions on this? Because it's That is the end of part four. You now have half.